The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This church has certainly set the standard on spiritual growth maturity. Well, anyhow, so the point is, is there they have planted churches. They have planted churches. Doctrinal flags, they've planted them all over. They've planted them. They got two on this island. They're going to go. They're going to have two and they're going to try to they're going to try to develop more than two. But they've got two. They got two in their major seaports. They've got two. Barnabas and John Mark have got two. And their job this time on the second trip is to strengthen them off from the first one, right? See, that's that's and see, that's why your second trip into a mission uh, mission area is really important. A third <laughs> or whatever. If you can if you can strengthen them, if you can develop their spiritual growth momentum. Right? That would teach the same old, same old. You want to push them ahead, don't you? You you know, you know. Okay. Okay. So you, you need to be thinking that way. When you got on the first trip, you should think that way. And be, and when you come back off that mission trip, you should listen, if there's interest in it, you should be thinking that way the second trip because boy are they on it. They listen, if you stay and I think I wrote this down, yeah. In the in the 14th chapter, verse 22, this is the first mission trip. In um, 1541, we're at the second mission trip. 1823, we're in the third mission trip. All three mission trips were involved in that. Go out and evangelize. Strengthen the church. Get the church engaged in planting more churches. Right? Make sure you got pastors in here that can teach the word of God. You go in there and you teach pastors. You go in there and you give the people, the congregation, uh, the importance of the word of God. You know, I think a lot about doing this. When I think about doing this, I think about when, I, when we were raising kids, being able to have other doctrinal parents in your church that that you could have your kids go and talk to when they think that, oh, you just are not, you ain't got your head together. To have somebody out there, you could actually go to them, and they, they could talk to them, tell them the same thing, but in a whole different way, right? Your kids come back, and they go like, well, yeah, you know, you're probably right. You just have a terrible personality or something, Dad. <laughs> and they go like, well, I can give you that. But it was it was so helpful to have these kind of people that were on the same page with you about raising kids and the word of God. It was, it was so important. Well, in the 15th chapter, verse 36, let us return and visit the brethren. This is the second mission trip vision. This is what they're after. Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Right. And that and that's very important. It was decided that Barnabas and John Mark would engage in the island mission to strengthen the churches, like in Acts 15:39. And Paul and Silas would engage in the land ministry off the first missionary trip, like in verses fifth chapter 15, 40 and 41, when you read that. Maybe that'll make more sense to you now. And who put that together? Verse 40 says, committed by the brethren. To the grace of the Lord. Did you see that? You know who he's talking about? He's talking about the church. See that in verse 40? Last part of verse 40. Are you with me? You know who did that? The guidance of the church. Didn't pick sides. Listen, the church, the only side the church is for is the Lord's. And weren't they smart to do that? Because they got two great mission teams off from this. Uh, Barnab point number two, Barnabas and John Mark were sent to the island of Cyprus. They went to, in the first trip, two major cities were converted and church established in them on two of the great seaports. It is a very important island, by the way. Very important island. 
some Christians, listen to me now, this is real. He's, let me tell you, God is, I want to, listen, can I tell you, no matter what conflict you're going through in life, God is in charge of everything going on. You say, you mean he was in charge when we had this? Yeah. You mean he was in charge when he had, yeah. You mean he was in charge? Yeah. I'm talking about the big charge. He let you think you were, right? See, Paul thinks he's in charge. Barnabas thinks he's in charge. The Lord, listen, the church has the good sense of grace to know it's the Lord's in charge, even though these two guys think they are. So what we got to do is to keep them mobile, get them out there and do what they do, and let the Lord show them that I'm in charge. You know why the Lord's in charge? Because he's the savior of the body, and he's the head of the church. Right? He's both those things. Ephesians 5.23. Yeah. He is the savior of the body, and he's the head of the church. Least we think we are. <laughs> I mean, every time I, I couldn't put my hat on because my head was so big. The Lord would always, I couldn't find a hat. Every hat I would pick up was too, too big. When the Lord got through with me, I could pay, take a little baby's hat and it would be too big. Now listen to me. Listen to what the Lord is doing way ahead of your trips. Listen to what the Lord is doing ahead of your tomorrow. <laughs> you know, you got your tomorrow planned, but he's got it planned. Yeah, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, you got a plan for tomorrow. We all have. But he's got the plan. Well, some of the Christians, listen, some of the Christians had traveled to Cyprus after the persecution of Acts 8-1. As missionaries. How about that? And they weren't the Indians. <laughs> when they got there, there were some missionaries already there. As well as to Antioch of Syria. You should read Acts 11, 19-23. The Apostolic Church of Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch because these missionaries didn't know how to do these things. They were winging it. <laughs> they needed some structure. They sent Barnabas to these groups of people under persecution that had fled and gone to these other regions. They went to the island of Cyprus. They went to Antioch of Syria as missionaries preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they didn't know how to establish churches. They didn't know how to, to, to establish people in spiritual growth momentum. They just had the gospel and had fire in their bones about it. So the Apostolic Church of Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas to Antioch, and this led to Barnabas getting Saul of Tarsus, now called Paul, to Antioch to work with him in establishing a church and developing a, a manual of spiritual growth momentum. Now, who put that together, dear hearts? Who put that program together? Now we got these two guys fussing a little bit about all this when the Lord has set this up from eternity past. Your day is no different today and tomorrow either, may I tell you that. So when you read Acts 11, 21 through 26, it gets pretty interesting. Who's in charge? Okay. Ephesians 5, 17. This is not on your paper, but it could be if you wrote it. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Foolish is not understanding. Foolish is trying to make decisions without the will of God. That's foolish. And it's this foolishness that gets us in arguments, gets us all polarized, and get us into separations, sweeping things under the rug, never getting any resolution. It's foolish. It's just pure foolishness. 
And some of the time, somebody's going to roll back the carpet and go like, oh, did you know what was under here? It's not hardwood floors. It's a bunch of dirt. Listen, here's what I've learned. I've learned that it's a small world inside the universal church. It's a small world. You know, I'd hear people say that, you know, it's a small world coincidences and things like that when I was a kid growing up. But listen, in the church, it really is a small world. It's amazing to me. God's magnificent. He true. Listen, the Lord truly is the savior, the head of the church. And all you have to do is step out of your little comfort zone, go someplace else, and you will find it. You will find believers there. They're on fire for God. I don't care where you go. It's a small world inside the church. It may be a big one out. It's a small world inside the church, and it's wonderfully networked because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This doctrine or principle is the same as these two missionary teams as they are being sent out on the second missionary trip. A synagogue has been established at the seaport of, of, of uh, Salamis. In Acts 13, 5, and mentioned again in 11, chapter, verse 19, they went there and spoke. The Jews, when they got there, they thought they was only should only preach the gospel to Jews. So they established a synagogue to preach the gospel. Then they found out, well, there were a lot of Jews. They didn't like it. So they were in trouble. So Paul came along and the Barnabas and they established churches. Churches were established at these two great seaports. You can study it on the map. I have another principle. It's not on your paper, but it could well be if you write it. Ephesians 1.11. There's always the bigger picture than the snapshot you're carrying in your life. Your snapshot every day. Listen, there's always a bigger picture behind every day. You say, what kind of a day you have? you right. What kind of a day do you have? Uh, So-so. Are you kidding me? How could you have a so-so day? What's a so-so day? I mean, if the the Lord shows up any part of that day, it's not a so-so day anymore. Right? How can you have a so-so day? Listen, I've learned so much from Jane. You know, Jane was a person when the church doors were open, she was there and she was there to minister to people. That's not possible on a regular basis as it used to be in her life. But I can tell you, I live with this woman. I can tell you she has a ministry beyond ministries. That phone rings. It's all about the Lord. She has an enormous ministry. Uh, Her her prayer life and her ministry life that comes from people coming to her because she can't go to them is amazing. I mean, it is amazing. It is amazing to me. And it's in some ways, I suppose she could be considered a partial shut in by people's terms. But listen, the network inside, I watch it and I go like, you know what? It's a small world inside the church. Because universally, she talks to people in the universal church all over the, all over the place. So here's my, here's my verse, Ephesians 1.11. There's always the bigger picture. This is my point. There's always, a, having been predestined, this is a powerful idea, having been predestined, According to his divine plan, purpose, watch this, who works. Because you're predestined in the plan of God, because you're predestined, every person in this room, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, both both on the internet at home, right, off the internet, listen, it, if you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have been predestined in the plan of God. You have an important role. Don't let anybody tell you you're not important. My wife has grasped that idea. 
having been predestined according to the, the, the divine plan of God, who, watch this now, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Let him do that. Let him do it. The only thing that stands in the way of that not happening in your life is volition. It's the only, that's the only thing. That is the only thing, Ephesians 1.11. Here's point three, Ephesians 1.11. Point three, Paul chose Silas as his missionary par partner. He was a spiritual mature leader in the apostolic church of Jerusalem. A lot of people don't pay any attention. Sometimes you get these names, you ought to research them, see, see who these people were. See, when he picked Silas, I went, wait, he picked Silas. I'm a little familiar with Silas having studied the book of, of Acts. That went back and took a look at him. Silas was a, a, a doctrinal emissary of the apostolic Jerusalem church. You can read about it in Acts 15, 22 through 35, which is a long section. When the Jerusalem conference was over, certain guys were handpicked because of their spiritual mature leadership and were sent out as embassies of the doctrine of grace. And he was one of those guys. Uh, you can read about him. He was also, he had the spiritual gift of prophet. In Acts 15, 29 and 32, Peter remarks that he's called, sometimes he's called, instead of Silas, kind of a nickname, uh, Savannah. You'll see his name. First Peter 5, 12, Peter remarks about him. Peter knew him well. He was part of that apostolic team in the Jerusalem church. After visiting the Antioch church, Acts 15, 34, we're on the second missionary trip, Paul and Silas. After visit, visiting uh, the Antioch church, this is when he was still working. Listen to me now. This was while he was still working for the apostolic church as an emissary of the, do of the doctrine of grace that had been acquired out of Acts 15. He winds up the Antioch church to go over this go over this doctrine with him to be sure. He, in other words, he's teaching the doctrine of grace. Like, like Rick is out when he's out on admission trips with uh, the principle of grace as an emissary of grace. He goes out there and he knocks this thing down doctrinally. That's what he's doing. He's going all over for the apostolic church doing it. He winds up at Antioch. He winds up at Antioch. This is before the first missionary trip and before the second missionary. He winds up there. He winds up there, and listen to what the Bible says. In the 15th chapter 34, it says, It seemed good to Silas to remain there. He went, I like this. He says. This is one of those da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da moments. This is how God's works with spiritual mature believers. When you note in Acts 15.30, listen, this was in Acts 15.34. When you get to our lesson text, Acts 15.36-41, we got a problem on sending one missionary team out. We've got to send two. <laughs> and we, and Paul, Paul, pick you a partner that you're going to dance on the mission field with. Pick you a partner. And it was obvious who he, if he would accept who he would take, Silas. He says to Silas, how would you like to go on a mission trip with me and preach the doctrine of grace? <laughs> Silas says, cha-ching! Now I know why I'm in Antioch. Cha-ching! I mean, who does that stuff? You can, listen, these people could have planned that. They weren't in a frame to plan that. God Almighty, who's in charge of your life? Please say not yourself. <laughs> Please don't say yourself. Because you'll have a miserable day if you think you are. This is how God works. This is how this was at the same time a second member of the Pauline team was needed. And there he is. And boy, was he the right guy. Just like John Mark was the right guy for Barnabas 
Silas. And you, now you're going to find Silas with Paul. Paul don't let him go. It, Paul takes him with him. And you know what this guy said? You know what his mission trip is, Rick? Everywhere Silas goes, you know what he's going to teach? He's going to teach grace. He's going to teach a doctrine of grace. That came out of the Jerusalem conference. Laid out. Point by point. <laughs> Oh, man, you can't make this stuff up, man. This is so good. It is also interesting that Silas, like Paul, is a Roman citizen. So when they get to Philippi and they get thrown into Roman prison, they pull the Roman card. And boy, the fear of God, well, the fear of Rome fell over the jailers and the administrators of of Rome, uh, uh, Providence administrators. You can read. You can read about that also in uh, Acts sixteen thirty one. It is in that Philippine. Listen, it's in the Philippi jail that the famous conversion of the jailer is. Right? What must I do to be saved? You remember that in sixteen thirty one. I mean, this stuff is. I mean, this is so good. So you, you can read about it, 16th chapter, 37, 38. It is interesting when on the second, well, <laughs> yeah, listen, I love when God lets you in on the backside of the history side of something that was planned way out here in eternity past. And then he lets you see it on a historic side. You look back and you go like, wow. And God shows you how he put all the pieces together. Watch this. Watch it. I mean, this is too good. You couldn't make this stuff up. It, it gets interesting when on the second missionary trip, Paul and Silas allow a young, immature believer named Timothy to join their team in Lystra. Listen, we're not going to take John Mark because he's an immature believer, but now we're going to take Timothy. This is not too good. Is this not too good? And why is that? Oh, I don't know. Either Silas or Paul. Paul certainly has had a change of heart, hasn't he? Come on now. I don't think John Mark. He can't hold his. He can't, you know, he, he runs out of water in his canteen. You never, water, you never run out of water in your canteen, buddy. You either drink less or get more. <laughs> I didn't put up with that. Now he picks up a guy on the second missionary trip at Lystra. You know where Lystra is? This is what's really good. So I get the map down. I take a look. And, and we, got, we got Lystra down here. We got up, like right up here. And right below it is Pamphylia. Pamphylia, the, on the first missionary trip, John Mark uh, Paul and Silas went to Cyprus. From there, they went to Pamphylia. When they got to Pamphylia, uh, John Mark says, I got to go home. And Paul goes, like, you got to do what? I, I, I expect you to say I have to go to the bathroom. I did not expect you to say I got to go home. So they had to put them on a ship and send them back. Put them on a ship and send them back. This is what I love. See, Pamphylia is right here. Lystra is right here. It's a city just above it. He sends John Mark back and then picks up on the first trip and picks up Timothy on the second. I'm not going to hear no, he's not, he knows young kids that don't know what's coming up. I'm not going to put up with that. They can't keep water in their canteen. So he picks up one. Listen, picks up the one that God wanted him to pick up. God wanted Barnabas to mentor John Mark, and he wanted Paul. Is there any, is there any doubt that God wanted Paul to mentor Timothy? He became like a son, right? You know who's in charge of all this stuff, people? 
You couldn't, you could not come up with this in a million years. Who's in charge? Who's in charge? God Almighty, who's in charge of your life? How you close your day will determine that. How you close your night out will determine. What kind of day you have? People say, I've had a miserable day. What are you talking about? You miss the Lord. You miss the Lord somewhere. How can you have a bad day with Jesus? I don't know. Who's in charge? Paul will write back. I, I gave you all that scripture up there. Paul will write back to the mission church after the second missionary trip. When he gets back, he'll write letters back, doctrinal letters, you know, to the church at Philippi and yada, yada. And will mention the team. Listen, you know what? Listen, here's his, his letterhead. Paul's missionary team. Letterhead, Paul, Silas, Timothy. He records it in 2 Corinthians 1, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 Thessalonians 1. On his letterhead is his team. It is now called Paul, Silas, and Timothy. <laughs> Paul has come a long way, you know. I know he got there. God, you know, who's in charge. You know what Paul discovered on the second missionary trip that God must always be in charge. I'm in charge. When you get home, when you get back home, he, here, here's what he's going to say. Paul, when you get back home, there won't be a rug on your living room floor. Because I, I took it out and I cleaned the floor. You know what that means? It means stop, stop being judgmental. Stop, stop putting false expectation on other people. Right? What did they do at Antioch? They swept it under the rug, didn't they? God removed the rug and went, look, we're not going to do that anymore. Quit. quit. You understand that? Don't let, don't let God have to come in and, and, and remodel your home, your marriage. Do it yourself. Put the Lord first. Who's in charge? You know who's in charge? The Lord. And if he's not, nothing's going right. It's, nothing's going right. I could tell you that. I don't even have to visit your house. Who's in charge? 2 Corinthians 1, 18 and 19, Paul writes back, God is faithful. Our word to you is not yes or no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who preached among you by us, by me, Silas, Timothy, was not yes and no. It was yes in Christ. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I mean, boy, has Paul learned some lessons on this trip. You let God build your expectations in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your ministries. Let him build them. Let him build them. He wants to build them. Does he not want to build them? He's done everybody on these trips. Was not Barnabas the right guy for John Mark? Yeah. Was not Paul the right guy for Timothy? Yeah. Whoever guessed that. If you'd have said Paul before he got on the ship to sail away on the second missionary trip, well, God will probably give you a John Mark before you get back. You had to run his whole day. <laughs> you had to run his whole day. That's what God did. Point four. What should be the church's policy in helping resolve conflict regarding missionary or ministry? Missionary or ministries in the church. Listen, it's so simple. It's so simple. The Lord's will be done. It's, it's not what is Paul. It's not what is Barnabas. It's what is the Lord. He's the savior of the body and the head of the church, right? Ephesians 5.23. It's about, listen, the church must always be that. If you're going to be a church leader, always be sure that the ch church stays on the Lord's side and nobody else's. I'm not on anybody's side. I'm on the Lord's. 
I'm on the Lord's side. The Lord's will be done. That's a grace approach. It's a grace approach because Christ is the Savior and the head of the church. I used four ideas. In this case, the selecting of ministry of missionaries, Acts 13, 1 through 3. Why they were while they uh, this is the first trip. Why they and this is true for all of them. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Paul. For the work for which I have called them. Let me tell you, I don't care how many mission trips you take. That always should be the protocol. Always the protocol. Know in your heart, the Holy Spirit has directed you. That he's got peace with you. And you've, he's given you counsel and direction. And you've spent a great deal of time uh, with him and prayer. Sending missionaries. Second part of the church. Acts 15, 39 and 40. Two missionary teams. The Lord, the church being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. Settling doctrinal disputes, Acts 15, 1. We saw it at Jerusalem Conference. There it was about the message and mechanics of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, what is the gospel? Romans 1, 16, what is the mechanics? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, what is, what is, the, what is the source of salvation? For by grace I am saved through faith and not of myself. It is a gift of God. In Acts 15, 11, it was decreed by the apostolic church of Jerusalem. But we believe that we Jews are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they Gentiles are also. Paul goes on in the book of, of Galatians, third chapter, and talks about the equality in Christ that's not there anywhere but in the church. And every community that has a doctrinal church, a grace-oriented church, should have that principle. Supporting the Lord's will. In Acts 21, Agabus comes to Paul. He's a, a recognized, well a well-renowned prophet, Agabus. And, you know, he takes his belt off, takes Paul's belt off and ties him up and says, whoever the owner of this belt is, this is what's going to happen. If he goes any further than right here, you better stop, uh, put his belt on, go back home. Right? You better not go any further east because whoever owns his belt is supposed to go west, not east. All right. And listen, how, how what were, what were the church? What, what did the church do? Listen, there, here's a, here's a grace church. And since he, Paul, would not be persuaded. We fell silent, remarking the will of the Lord be done. Because it will, won't it? Well, well I don't know, Paul. Excuse me, Paul. How did it work out? Oh, the Lord's will. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Yeah. So listen, it's not complicated where the church where the church should always stand on issues like this. What is the will of the Lord? May the will of the Lord be done. I mean, it says that. Why? Because Colossians 324 says it is the Lord whom we serve. It is the Lord whom we serve. Not people. It's the Lord. Well. Thank you, people. I mean, how is it? How is it? Do you think the you think the Lord still wants to send missionaries? Absolutely. Wants to send them on the home front and the foreign front. You know, when you say missionaries, everybody gets kind of nervous because they think they're going to Shawanga Ganga. <laughs> But it could be just across the street, couldn't it? Just down the road. It could be It could be like Calvin driving past a, a little place and praying to God, I need to have a ministry. He drives past the retirement home, and the Spirit said, well, why don't you pull over and see if there's one here? He pulls over, and sure enough, they go like, we've been waiting for you. Where you been? <laughs> Where you been? Well, I've been driving past this every day looking for a place to minister. Right. 
Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way to study was both by automobile and by Internet. We pray, Father, that we would be stirred within our hearts for missions and to understand the conflicts that are involved in it can be resolved with a simple idea is what, what is the Lord's will? Well, let's discover that. Let's, let's investigate that. And then whatever decision we make out of that, that we think is compatible with the will of God, may we learn from this lesson that God is in charge. Who's in charge? Who's in charge? Who's in charge of this outfit? <laughs> the Lord. God Almighty. And, he, and you, Father, have planned all these things. You've arranged, as I call it, the furniture of our, of our life. You've, re, re, you've arranged all this that we might operate in great comfort and confidence in your, your magnificent plan. And that is our will for our people tonight. In this prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him.